So can I just, on behalf of the lay community, say a huge welcome to Jay. Really looking forward to tonight. Delighted that you're here and opening up our summer series of talks. So um, we, we are a lay community and uh, we're really keen to hear different experiences and different ways of, of, of experiencing life. And so when Anna came up with her program for summer series, starting off with you, we're absolutely delighted. So I'm going to let Anna introduce you, but I just wanted you to know that you're very, very welcome on behalf of the community. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anna, um, and I'm the community discipleship and digital coordinator. So I'm also very happy to welcome you all to the first of this summer series, which is a series that will weave together a variety of perspectives and stories on what it means to build and live uh, in Christian community today. The LCSB um, is a community that is inspired and shaped by Benedictine spirituality. And I believe that throughout his role, St. Benedict continually challenges us with the question, um, how do we live well together? So over the next few months, we'll hopefully discover for ourselves how we might begin to answer that question in our um, world and context today. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Jay Hume. Jay is an award-winning transgender performance poet, speaker, and educator. Jay is currently poet in residence at the Poets Church, St. Giles in the Fields in central London. In late 2019, his fascination with old buildings turned into a life-changing encounter with the God who had never believed in, and he was baptized in the Anglican Church. His latest poetry collection, The Back of the Sermon, details his journey to be placed in Baptism during an unprecedented worldwide pandemic. And this evening, Jay is going to speak to us um, about his love for old church buildings and discovering belonging in community. So, Jay, over to you. Excellent. So, let's share this screen, shall we? So, I want to talk to you about church. What is a church community? What makes a church community? And what makes a church? Obviously, this is a door that leads into a church, hence the sign. So I, I have a thing, I call them my church adventures. I go around the country and I photograph churches. And when I go to them, people expect me to photograph this, which I do, you know, it's very, very pretty, the sublime, the grand, the the fancy, the beautiful, the sunlit days, the the great mosaics, and I also end up photographing that. Um, these are Mason's marks from Tewkesbury Abbey, and I'm stood there with my camera about three inches from the column, taking pictures of random chunks of stone, or this, all of the cobwebs in St John's in Scunthorpe that now isn't even an active church. Um, if there's peeling paint, I am going to be the one photographing it. If there's a giant cobweb, yeah, that's me. If there's anything written anywhere, I'm taking a photograph. And the question is, why? And that's that's the point of the talk, right? So I'm going to start by telling you about St. John's in Scunthorpe. So St. John's is no longer a church. It was built in the 1900s to be one of the, um, by, by a rich benefactor to be the church for the community who were who were working near there at the time. It was made far too big um, out of ironstone, which is generally OK, but not always um, depends on how it was laid. It does sometimes just wear away. Um, and the plan was that the people would use it and it was it was never full. Um, and by the time that it closed, people were using just the chancel to avoid freezing to death in the nave um, and it was finally taken over by what's called the 2020 um, art center who added the extension that you can see to the left um, and ended up putting a huge amount of work in to stop it falling down i wasn't allowed in areas of the compound without a hard hat um, the external areas the inside is is entirely safe and i was called in to write a poem so i climbed all over the church um, which is now 
fairly bare. They didn't rip out anything that was already there except for the sort of furniture, any memorials stayed in place. They didn't have any stained glass to remain in place. Um, and it begins that question, what is a church and what is a church building and what is a community and how does that work? And so because I was writing a poem, I lay on the floor and chatted to the, the person who'd called me in for about two hours. And we just talked about the church and, and what it does now that it's an art center. Um, and the person said to me, you know, um, what we do is this and told me the whole story of how they're free to enter community foundation. They give out free bus tickets so people can come and experience art. Young people congregate there, older people who don't have a community congregate there. And I was laying there staring at the, the angels that are still hanging off the ceiling. And I thought, this is functioning aside from the faith if you look at the pastoral side the community side this building is still a church this building is still doing exactly what the church set out to do when it was first built by that benefactor 100 200 years ago it was built to care for the community that popped up around it who worked in the steelworks and couldn't afford much better and to this day it's still caring for that community that popped up around the steelworks and can't do much better. And so when it came time for me to write the poem, I wrote a poem called Community in Common. So when Anna said to me, you want to talk that's about churches and community, I thought, what better place to start than St. John's? And I will read you uh, the poem. And if you look here, they spray painted a part of the poem underneath the um, on some of the boards that are surrounding the bit you're not supposed to walk on because it will fall on you. Um, and, and the poem goes like this. On a summer afternoon, the light's the same as it ever was. A golden flurry, sun wash, a gloss of gravitas amidst the arches. And the reasons we come here are broadly the same, seeking our truths in the beauty and pain of the things that we see, but cannot quite say. The building moves on, but the meaning will stay. It's a service provided, no matter the reason, to show you your heart through the changing of seasons in art or in sacrament, sculpture or saint. A community thrives when it's given the space. And it really helped solidify for me why I was so obsessed with churches. I, I came to faith because I was obsessed with church buildings, couldn't stop going in them, kept having emotions in them and wondering what that was about. Um, and finally realized that it was about God. And part of me, and it's a very unorthodox part of me, wonders if that art center isn't sharing the gospel in a way better than some churches because it calls people in and does the good work. And it's a really interesting question. And so we look at churches as holders of community. And that's what I realized um, in a way that I hadn't before at the art center, um, that churches are holders of community. And that's why I take photos of things like those ugly Mason's marks that don't mean anything because Mason's marks were carved there by the people who first built the building. They are signatures in stone. They are a connection between us and the past and the people who came before and loved before. And I always say I love church buildings because they are the only buildings on earth that would not exist without love. You know, houses are built because people need housing. Businesses are built so that people can run businesses. Churches only get built when people love them and they only stay up because people love them. And so let's talk about a church that is loved. Um, literally days before I was baptized, I got this message on Twitter that said, hi, I'm getting a contact on behalf of my father, Reverend John Potter, a United Reformed Church minister in Norwich. One of the churches in his group, Prince's Street Reformed Church, built in the early 1800s, is unfortunately having to close due to a maintenance issue that the church can't afford to rectify. As a way to remember the church and share its story with the world, he'd like to invite you to come and have a look around. Um, and it was due to be closed. Everything was about to be ripped out days after I was baptized. So I said yes. And two days after I was baptized, I drove to Norwich to see this tiny little church. So Princess Street Reformed Church, it is not the fanciest of churches. It was built in 1820. 
Um, I, I look, you know, the church I'm assistant church warden at was built in the 800s. You know, I'm, I'm used to looking at the older, grander, fancier things. Opposite this one is a church in classic Norwich style flint from the 1400s on the other side of the road. But I was here to see Prince's Street. And this is um, Prince's Street United Reformed Church. Um, your standard balcony chapel style very very beautiful it's just been redone because they didn't realize that the roof was about to fall in um and so they spent a quarter of a million doing it up to be a community space um and then they found out all the nails holding the roof tiles were rusted and they needed to find another half a million which they didn't have and so it closed on its 200th anniversary and so i was called in to look around and i really want to tell you about this because it's one of the most profound experiences i've ever had in a church so these are the photos I was expected to take. She's very, very beautiful. There is absolutely no denying it. Um, gorgeous color, wonderfully evocative pews, memorials everywhere. And people think the memorials are where you find the community, where you find the people, right? You walk into a church and you, you read about so-and-so who died having done whatever for the church. And I don't know. I find the formality of them quite jarring. They're the, they're the story that people want to be told. And I'm always interested in what the real story is, what I call the chaos is, what the truth is. So you have these all over the church telling you about so-and-so who did such and such. Um, but then you have this. The first thing I saw when I walked in was the visitor's book. And I did not sign the visitor's book because there's something very important about the fact that they had had a service two days before where they all signed the visitor's book for the last time because this church was closing. And they filled the prayer box for the last time. And it's these things, these pieces of ephemera, these pieces of taper from lighting the candle, the leftover Clark's shoebox full of Bibles that tell you the story of the people of this place. Here's the uh, the hymn board that they will never fill again. And they did not buy and they bought a new hymn board. Did they replace the numbers? No. Um, and it speaks to the people. And I love these things, these little messages. Um, this one really got me. Um, what, a few months after I did this, the organist at um, our church, who'd been there for over 60 years uh, as organist, um, died. And he had the exact same walking stick that's in this picture. And his is still hanging around our church and no one wants to throw it out. Why? Because it speaks to the community and the people of this place. And they become part of the fabric of the building. I was allowed to go in the organ because it was closing down and so the organist couldn't shout at me. And even there in the bit where nobody ever goes, there are memories of the church. On the left, you've got a record of all of the organ fixing stuff. I don't know anything about organs, but it was just lying there and bits of um, repair work, old fuses, things like that. And then on the right, you've got this picture of um, this cross that you can see lying down here that used to be hanging on the wall. Um, and again, we've got this community living physically through the building, these chairs lined up with a couple turned the other way so that people can watch what's happening in the church. These acts of humanity, all of these um, signs that were abandoned in the um, in the balcony because nobody needed the balcony anymore. And so we went through them, the friend of mine who I took, and we found all of these cradle rolls. Um, speaking of the community that had been here before and the people and these once hung on the walls because this building is a home for people. It's a home for a community. Mm. You've got this, which really got me, um, the Norwich churches together. All of the city centre churches signed this pledge um, of what they would do. The next time that this is signed, they do it every few years, Princess Street won't be on it. And it speaks this movement through time. Um, on the bottom um, right here, you've got the founder of the church, John Alexander, um, and all of these signs of life. This font, the person who was showing me around was baptized in this font. They didn't know what they were going to do with it. I mean, it's just a physical object, but for them, it's really important. What do you do when a church closes with your font, with your books? Um, and then there are the little plaques and they're my favorite plaques. You've got the big plaques, you know, the big grand marble plaques. Then you've got the little ones. And I think they really speak to who the church is because it's the people who can't afford to have a marble plaque, who aren't the fanciest. I think who often leave the biggest mark, like Emily. What happens to Emily's 
plaque what happens to the little bible rest that it's on i don't know neither did the minister john who was looking around he had no idea what he was going to do with any of it either they had a skip coming the next day do you throw it out and then there were the books so this is in memory of albert this wasn't the book on the pulpit we'll come to that in a minute but there was this stack of books and this is the most amazing thing i've ever found in a church and i have been in hundreds of churches i've climbed around dozens of organs i have been up every church tower i've been allowed up and some that i was not and this stack of book contains the most amazing thing i've ever found in a church and it's just rotting and mouldering by this single glazed window and so in this pile with these books this presented to the founder of the church reverend john alexander um, the rector was really excited when I showed him this. He was like, oh, John Alexander will take this to another one of our churches. This book um, that was given by John Alexander to the schoolroom that they had recently sold off. Um, and the, again, the reverend was like, oh, John Alexander. And then there was this book that was on the, on the pulpit when I arrived. And before we left, we flicked to the front and opened it. And it was a family Bible with hundreds of years, like over a hundred years of births deaths and marriages written in the front and I said to John you might not want to throw this one out actually John because it's a family bible and he looked picked it up and he looked at it and he said oh it's the whatever family I can give it them back and this family have been going there for over a hundred years and their bible had just been lying around because that's the truth isn't it when we use churches our stuff ends up in them too we end up sharing stuff I know in our church there is a about half of an Ikea bookshelf that a church warden put there years ago when she was moving house and it's still there we should throw it out um, and then there's this um, given to the granddaughter of John Alexander again this founder keeps popping up not in the grand plaques but in a picture with a broken frame and a couple of books abandoned on a windowsill and not just him everybody so there's AJ George and all of these people, Sister Jenny, all of whom has books that were just slowly abandoned in the church. Very few of them were formal gifts. You can tell by the inscriptions. A lot of them just sort of got left there. I'm a testimonial to the Reverend John Alexander reporting on the public meeting held in St Andrew's Hall in Norwich in 1856. And then underneath, if there is already a copy of this belonging to Princess Street Church, I should be glad to have this copy returned to me. And then there is this. So you will have noticed in this that um, there was a note, Helen Coleman, and the Colemans, being Norwich, pop up. But this book is the most astounding book I found. A polyglot Bible, polyglot Bible, very standard, very tatty. And there was this inscription. I don't know about you, but I can't read it. I've got no idea what that says. Not a clue. I'm not a genius. But it was amazing. We opened it up and it was full of this shorthand note taking references in red and then the shorthand in black pen. Um, I've never seen anything like it. So I knew there was something quite special here, but I didn't know what I had found. Look at all these cross references and note taking and the hand that wrote these things. Um, like I said, the cross references are in red. Clearly, this is a biblical scholar or a preacher or something. Um, there's even um, a sheet of paper with notes um, and a list of sermons and books and things that they want to go back to. So I go back to this inscription. I'm like, who is this person? Um, and so I message my friend who works in an archive. Uh, Got to have good friends. And I say to him, if, there's a, if you're about, can you read this? And he messages me back. The date is the 1st of March, 1668. It's Mary Coleman. And I'm like, well, I think you're wrong on the 16s. But if it's Mary Coleman, that tracks. Because here we've got that note that she would like it back from Helen Coleman. Um, and then a Bible that belonged to James and Laura Stewart of Carrow Abbey, which is where the Colemans lived, gifted after the death of Laura by Ethel and Helen Coleman. And then he works out that it's actually from 1888 um, and that it is from her father and mother, her father being the person who founded Coleman's Mustard in the first place, big civic family. And so this Bible with all of its various cross references belonged to Ethel Coleman. Who is she? She was the first lady mayoress in England. 
she was one of the first female deacons in England. We had just found rotting on a windowsill, a Bible that belonged to a deeply important historical figure, who was also just an unassuming member of the church community who just happened to abandon her Bible in a corner one day. Here she is, here is Ethel. And I turned to my friend who I'm with who um, works in museums and had just um, stepped down from a job as a museum curator. And I'm like, what do we do here? John, the Reverend, was literally gonna just, you know, throw these books away, what do you do? What do you do with books from hundreds of years? Or what do you do with the ephemera of life that builds up in a church? I don't have any good answers for that, but when it comes to these, I had an answer. We got in touch with the people at the Norwich Museums and the Norwich Archives, and they took them away. Um, they stabilized them from the damp. And these books that I found on the windowsill, you can see there's the polyglot Bible. And that one is the Bible from Caro Abbey are now in a museum. They were part of an exhibition about important women in Norwich. These things that we find in our churches are so important that they are kept in museums and archives and shown off, but we don't even know what we've got. And so here we have Princes Street URC, one of the least assuming churches in Norwich, a city which has enough churches that you back in the medieval period when they were all open could literally go to a different church every single Sunday, they had over 52 churches in the city centre alone. And here we've got Princes Street, 1820, holding secret history that's so important for the community. Um, and that exhibition that those Bibles um, were sent to was used to encourage female empowerment within the city um, and women becoming parts of leadership positions and equality. And they were just little Bibles abandoned on a windowsill. And you find this in churches, you find the stories of people and communities, either very, very formally in things like this. Um, and they tell the story of places as well. So if you look at the war memorial, the battles in Northern Ireland, they never put an end to that. If you look at the one slightly to the left of it, a family who lost all of their children underneath really, really important um, figures who use tombstones have been lifted up and propped up against a wall because they're not important anymore. But the art that they leave behind is seen as important. Or you see the informal signs of people, graffiti everywhere. I love a bit of graffiti. They used to put the effort in back in the day and do it in cursive or add actual serifs. And I really respect that. Um, then you find it everywhere, particularly um, in bits that you don't expect and often builders graffiti, giving you the times and dates when things changed. And when things change in churches, that generally means that there's been money. So you can track the history of the community through the history of the church. When they added bits was when the community had money. Um, and when they bits fell down and weren't replaced, maybe the community didn't have money anymore. And in a way, um, churches are records of a community through time in a way that no other building is because no other building is used for the same purpose um, throughout all of those hundreds of years. Most things change. For example, in Leicester, we have the Guild Hall. Um, and people say, oh, you know, the Guild Hall, it's ancient. Um, and yeah, it's from the 1300s, but it's been a guild hall, it's been a prison, it's been a library, it's been an art centre, it's been a museum. Churches have been the same thing. Um, and so the way that the history is told is consistent. So you can really, really track it. But you also have funny stuff, um, either deliberately funny, like a warning from some monks that the steps to Calvary can be dangerous, um, to less deliberate funnies, like questions that I have about why you need to put underlined do not burn paper on the gas fire and do not light candles within 10 seconds of sanitizing your hands and do not place anything on this tomb and you wonder what people have done and it tells a story of people's actions through time both really historically and important like Mary Ethel Coleman whose books are in a museum and whichever stupid person decided to set paper on fire on the gas fire um, and it speaks to the people um, and you have tiny things like um, this flower arranger's prayer and rosary hidden in a cupboard at Manchester Cathedral. And you go to Manchester Cathedral and you look at the grand stuff, right? And then hidden in the corner is the people. And we can't forget the people because, as I said before, churches do not exist without community and without love. And the people who arrange the flowers love the place so much that they put a tiny little prayer laminated and hanging on the back of a door. 
you also find stuff that maybe wasn't supposed to be there forever. Um, I find a lot of chalk graffiti and it ranges from the standard, a warning on a clock that it winds up every 80 minutes so that when it does you don't get scared, to remember to switch off the light, to some person just deciding that they're going to graffiti a chamber of hard labour in really creepy letters halfway up a church tower just to like mess you up, or help on a spiral staircase in Liverpool Cathedral, which to be honest, having just climbed that spiral staircase, I respect that, yeah, I would want help at about that point. Um, two signs that tell you what the community is about. Um, advertising small things that are for some people big things. Um, services and, and the way people display services tells you a lot. You know a lot about a church, whether they say it's a Eucharist or a mass, right? Um, and then you've got bell chambers. I love bell chambers. Bell ringers are the people who definitely make churches their home the most because they're given a room far away from everyone else and they are left to it. I've yet to meet a priest who isn't scared of their bell ringers. Um, and you always find a bowl or a box of sweets in a bell chamber. You always find a load of abandoned books about bell ringing and you always find a vast number of plaques. And here we have an example of all of those um, loitering. Um, but you also find stuff like this, the bells are raised, it's very dangerous. There, that is one way to tell you that bell ringing is dangerous. Here is another way that I found in the exact same church. It is dangerous to touch the bell ropes unless you are a competent ringer. And then pictures of what are clearly the bell ringers. Um, and it's just this great in-joke. I don't know whose poodle that is, but they're not allowed to ring the bells. And again, you've got people making churches their home and making them part of a community. Um, in every church, one of the most common things you find are little handwritten or typed reminders that the church needs money. Um, and I collect photos of them. I really, really do. Um, we, we range from the burden is very heavy, but with your generosity, it will be lighter to the arms chest will be found beneath the tower um, and everything in between. I don't know who decided that they needed to paint the donations box red, but someone clearly thought that that would highlight that it was there and get them more donations. And in that, there is a story of people deciding that they need more donations, that they need to flag up what they need. Um, wall safes versus arms chests tell you stuff. How a community has decided to fundraise tells you a huge amount. If you're to Tewkesbury Abbey, they do it. Um, it costs five pounds a minute to run the Abbey and a little perspex box, sort of like a museum. Um, and then you go all the way on the other side to a church that just has a wall safe and the word gifts written above it um, by hand. Um, and they're two, they tell stories of two very different communities and two very different ways of being. And you can tell a lot about the people who use that building and a lot about the way that building is seen through these little things. So I was also asked to do some poems. Um, and so this presentation will go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Um, and I will do you some poems about churches and community, having shown you some of the very different ways that we can see churches and community. So my little church is St Nick's and I joined it during COVID, which meant that we weren't allowed in the building. We're in Leicester, which means that we were really not allowed in the building for over a year. Um, and so we would gather on Saturdays because we weren't allowed to open for worship. Uh, but we could just open the church and leave it open. Um, so we would gather on Saturdays and look after the church and it was worship and it was community gathering and it was beautiful. And I wrote a poem about it. It's called All of This is Worship. And Ian of the Abandoned Walking Stick features um, the plague is happening. The plague is happening and services cannot happen in churches. The plague is happening and the law says we can only pray privately. On Saturdays, I walk an hour to church. It is winter now and I bow my head to the rain. There is a leak before the pulpit and someone changes out the bucket. We open the great dark door, lean it ajar to allow people in. Hang signs on the railings with zip ties, church open, church open. Sometimes people come in. The traffic outside keeps circling, often there are sirens, the plague is happening and we wear masks and there are sirens and sometimes people come in. I trim the candles on the altar, dig out the advent can hangings, nobody touches, nobody moves closer. Ian, parishioner here for an entire lifetime, remembers, reminds us how things should be. 
how they have always been, how they will be again. There is a break in the rain and I climb up to the roof, searching again for the leaf. We change out the bucket again. Though we've swept the leaves from the path, we will soon do it again. Things keep breaking. Things are always fixed. I cradle a candle in the crook of my arm, carve slivers of coloured wax from its base, three purple, a pink and a white. The stand they will soon fit in is crusted in wax, leave it, the priest says. It's a reminder. None of the candles stand straight in the stand we found, but that's okay. The Christmas tree was crushed a decade ago and it doesn't stand straight either. Nothing is straight at St Nick's. Someone comes in to pray, the rainbow flag flutters in the breeze from outside, Ian plays the organ simply because he can. I run my hand over these ancient stones, lean back in a pew, watch the sunlight play across the nave, listen to the rain, the sirens, the organ, watch as someone raises a duster built out of garden canes, feathers and duct tape, see them knock the dust from the tops of the archway. Hear the hoover as it moves through the vestry. Watch the tea lights flicker on the stand we found for the grieving. The plague is happening. The plague is happening and services cannot happen in churches. But this, all of this is worship. So coming to St Nick's during a plague, it was really amazing what that meant for community, because how do you build a community during a plague? I, I mean, I emailed the priest and I was like, how do you join your church when we're not allowed in church buildings? And she was like, I have literally no idea. Let's find out. And St. Nick's does a huge amount of community building. So um, it's in a very, very interesting position. Um, back in the 1970s, they, uh, they being the city council, demolished every single house in the parish to build a ring road. And so what do you do when your community is literally moved from what was the medieval slum housing to out of town estates and they build them estate churches and all you've got left is a church with nobody living in the parish? How do you build a community? So the Bishop of Leicester gave the church over to um, the university chaplaincy, despite the university being about a mile and a half across the city. And she thrived at that for many years. That's when Ian, parishioner here for an entire lifetime, joined us as um, the musical director of the church, the organist, he looked after the choir and he was there for over 60 years. And in those 60 years, things changed. Um, the university church ended up becoming known as a fairly inclusive space. There's something about university students that tends to lean on the more inclusive. Um, and then it fell out of favor with the university. Being an hour and a half away wasn't very popular. Students weren't that into singing in choirs anymore. Anyway, its heyday was sort of the 80s and very early 90s. Um, and then it became a sort of standard parish church again, joined in with another parish, which actually had houses in its area. In the early 2010s, houses were actually built um, in the area again, in these big high rise blocks. Um, and so the church finally had parishioners again, but nobody really came from those high rise blocks. People came because they'd heard that St. Nick's was an inclusive space and it built a deliberately inclusive community. Nobody, well, almost nobody. I know of two people who go to St. Nick's who live in the parish. Everybody else travels. Um, and people travel over an hour in each way to come because we built a community that they want to be a part of. And that community is an inclusive community for the LGBT community. Um, and that's what people decided that they need. And it's very, very interesting watching people join St. Nick's and find in it a community they didn't expect. Because yes, the building is amazing and from the 800s, but people do not come for the building except for on Saturdays. On Sundays, they come for the worship in a place where they feel welcome. Um, and somebody recently joined St. Nick's and they'd been going for three weeks um, and it was Easter, their third week. And the clergy walked over and went, do you want to do our Easter reading? And they went, yeah, I'm part of this church in three weeks. And we said to them, why are you okay with this? You know, you can say no. If the priests are bullying you into this, you can say no. And they said to me, this church is the only place in Leicester where I feel entirely comfortable to be myself without explaining who I am. They came for the community and they stayed for God because when you can be yourself, you can see Christ without that barrier of lies. 
Um, so Nyx is really special in that way. So indulge me while I do you another poem. It's called The Altar Frontal at St Nick's is a rainbow flag because I'm really bad at titling poems mostly. Um, and it talks about how it isn't special, but it is. There is nothing special about this church. People cluster in pews, partners, friends, a few families for good measure, a toddler cries. His mothers rise to a squat, hold hands, walk him slowly round the aisles. They circle the font where he was baptised alongside one of his mothers. The priest holds up the wafer, the chalice, papers rustle this order of service, an ambulance rushes by. The organ begins to breathe. Its song is older than we are. Come now, rise, approach this altar, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, the fellowship of Christ, these signs of peace. So every poet has obsessions. We all do, and we're lying if we say that we don't. Um, and throughout a collection, we end up making it very clear what our obsessions are. And in this one, I had a big obsession with the idea of signs of peace and the sign of peace. Um, it crops up a lot. And it's the idea that we offer one another a sign of peace quite, you know, it's prescribed, right? It's in the liturgy, you do it. If someone said, we offer one another a sign of peace and you went, no, actually, um, it wouldn't go down very well. Um, but we also offer one another signs of peace in a less formal way. So I think churches are full of these signs of peace. When you welcome someone in, you are offering a sign of peace. When you have strange things hanging on your walls from, you know, Margaret who put up the tea rotor 20 years ago and it's still there, there is something about that that to me is a sign of peace, a sign of community and getting on. So Nix is full of pride flags to signal to people. We have a lot of people who don't speak English as a first language and LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. And so symbols are very important to us because if you write on the wall, you're welcome if you're gay. If you can't read English, that's not very helpful. Um, so we fill it with signs of peace. And in the way we communicate with each other, we are constantly offering one another signs of peace. And I have another poem in this book that is obsessed with that idea. And it's that idea of trust and community. So when I joined St. Nick's, I was amazed to be allowed to do anything because as far as I was concerned, I was very dodgy and I'd only been there two weeks. Um, and then the priest was like, right, I'm getting the silver out. Do you want to carry it? And I'm like, you're just going to give me the church silver. Okay. <laughs> You don't know me. <laughs> like, like, I come from the really dodgy part of town, Karen. Um, and it's that trust in people um, that speaks to community, letting people do things, letting people be part of it. So I wrote this poem for the priest called Holy Chaos, and it is about that drawing people in and giving them trust and giving them signs of peace. You will notice um, the obsession. She reaches out and hauls us in by our frayed edges, hands us candles, says, you can do this. Believe. Throws us the keys, points out the drawer of silver, turns her back, take what you need. So we lift out the chalice in the fading light, it gleams, and then we place it on the altar, taking offerings of peace. And so it twists that idea. Um, in the poem, there is sort of a joke that we are going to steal it, right? Take what you need. Well, well, I'm having that silver. It'll pay my rent. But what I need isn't the physical, it's the trust. And that's what a lot of people need. And that's what a lot of churches in building community give people. Um, so I will end my poems on a funny note. Um, so I've recently been reading a book by the Pope Emeritus, um, written when he was carding Ratzinger. Um, I disagree with sort of 30% of it, but I, well, I agree with about 30% of it, but I feel like you should read things that you disagree with, right? And we both agree that the Eucharist is really, really important. Um, and again, it's that sense of community. The, the Eucharist is a community meal. We eat together. And when I was working out what the Eucharist meant for me, I wrote this poem called, You Eat God? question mark exclamation mark um while i was working out what it really means um and it's very short and very silly but it is again about that sharing and that community and that togetherness and i will read this and then we will do questions and i'm sure anna will be happy to field those and sort that out and be organized which i'm not 
I said, you eat God. They said, we eat God together. I said, you eat God. They said, God feeds us. We gather. I said, but you do eat God. They said, God is more than this. They said, here, take this bread. Thank you so much, Jay. I'm sure if we were in person, you would be hearing a very enthusiastic round of applause at the moment. So <laughs> thank you. Oh, well, I am now that you've you've guilted them into it. Yeah, I know. Now <laughs> you can see an enthusiastic round of applause. So, yep, as Jay said, we're going to open up some questions um, from all of you. So if you would like to put a question question to Jay, just use the hand raise icon. Um, if you can't work out how to do that, just put your hand up. <laughs> um, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, we'll try our best. Adam, straight away, off you go. <laughs> so thank you, Jay, for that really inspiring talk. It was wonderful and loved the poetry and loved so many of the images and the photos. It was fantastic. I'd just like to know, why do you like climbing up to the top of churches? Well, you know, I'm five foot two. There is a bit of short dog syndrome in it. Um, <laughs> Makes feel tall. Uh, no, it's because to get to the top of a church, you have to go through all the bits that you don't see. And they're the bits that people leave their mess in. And as you've seen, their mess is my favorite bit. It's, the, it's, the, it's in the hidden parts of churches that you find the truths of them. Because what's been taken down speaks a lot about what they used to love and what they didn't. And where do you put the stuff that you took down? In the bell tower, who's got storage space, right? I climbed up Manchester Cathedral, their records room is in the tower, just underneath the bells. Um, people leave their stuff in the in in the places you they don't think you will look and so i want to look there um, and also the views from the top are beautiful and i don't have any fear of heights i i love being up high and looking over a city there is something very very special about that but yeah there is something about the journey up to the top that's really important for me and what you see what you pass um all the hidden stuff you know i often go in churches and it's like i wonder how many people have been up here because this church has been here for 200 years so if you know couple of people a year did that. That's so few people having been in these places, you know. We live in a world where everything's been explored to the point that it's basically all on Google Street View. It's nice to be in places people haven't seen yet. It's sort of the world's weirdest way of looking at the unexplored. Thanks. Thank you. Barbara. Yes, yes. hello, Jay. Thank you so much. I found that totally fascinating. And the, the, the thing that really came to my mind is um, the church building is so important for so many people. And the way you show the memories, the roots, the, the attachment that people have. And uh, it just really ran with me because we're in an age with declining vacations. And I'm a Catholic and in our church. We're seeing churches amalgamating, parishes amalgamating, because we don't have enough people to fill that church building. Um, and, and then, uh, so that really rang with me. And then just your huge point, we build, it's all about the community, the building a community that people want to be part of. And it's not the building, that's the, it's the welcome that's important. And here you are this evening, and our church is a Zoom church, um, that actually, if you came and photographed our church at Easter, you'd be at Kevin Lee at a, a, Christian, a center of Christian welcome. Very different, we don't have that history, but I think you'd be quite fascinated. Um, and it's how do you reconcile the building with the community? because human nature is, we want to be linked, we want to be attached, we want to be part of that space, because that community space is our home. So I, I always think of church buildings as containers for community um, and, and, and representations of community, but containers come in in all different shapes and sizes. You know, if you try to have one size of Tupperware in your kitchen, things that go downhill really, really fast. Um, and so there's this idea that there isn't one size that fits all. Whenever I go and if we just, for a moment, we'll stick with church buildings and then we'll move to Zoom church. But if you, 
if you whenever I go and photograph churches, people are always amazed that I go to um, modern churches, estate churches, and I'm like, they're beautiful because they're loved and they're containers of a community. And that's what makes them beautiful. And that's what makes them loved. Um, and so I will go to churches that are falling down, churches that were built in the 40s, churches that people don't think are beautiful or special. Um, and they are beautiful and they are special. And I think part of that is because I joined church during COVID when there was this great lockdown, I had to reckon with the fact that I love church buildings and I just realized God existed and then all the church buildings closed and I had to work out what that meant for me. Um, and so my, I, the first time I went to a church service was in person. I waited for St. Nick's to open. We did one big service and then we were immediately back locked down because we were in Leicester. And so it was all on Zoom. And so I joined the community on Zoom. And so for me, the the buildings are containers of the community and those two things are separate, the building and the community, because I experienced it in that way in such a profound manner. And I mean, when I photograph churches, I always avoid photographing people because I think, you know, if you're in a church, I should leave you alone. Um, I wouldn't like to be photographed if I was praying. But I think if I were to photograph your church, um, it would be your living rooms, it would be your houses, it would be whatever you're looking at on the other side of the monitors. Um, and I'm sure that you to have things like that little prayer that I found in the flower ranger's cupboard um, with the rosary hanging off it. And you too have little notes, um, lists of people you want to pray for, things that are really important to you, prayers that you've spotted that, are, that, are, that you want to remember and pray. I know I've got a number of prayers to remind me to pray before I eat hanging on my fridge. And they are your church and your churches in the world. And that's very, very, beautiful you know so my book is called the backboard sermons because i spent a lot of lockdown wandering around the canals and dilapidated factories of leicester city center and being like god is in this god is here this is just as holy as a church um and it's because of people and, and the bits of people that you see and the thriving in those places that made them beautiful even though you know dilapidated factories and polluted canals are not the most beautiful places you see the way humans interact with them and engage with them and it is in the humans that you find the beauty thank you i think that's why i i called or you know when i put the title of this talk to jay it was community and sacred space rather than community and church because um churches are an obvious form of sacred space but spaces are sacred when people do things in them <laughs> um, on that note i'm going to do your poem <laughs> and then we're going to go stop, to won't be stopped. yeah <laughs> absolutely um it's just you said god is everywhere so let's do that if god is everywhere then everywhere is holy everything is holy everyone is holy the blaspheming tongue holy the maze of streets holy the broken street light that flickers on at 2 a.m to welcome home the dying it too is holy the homeless are prophets and saints as much as these bones and fragments treat them with reverence and love them for they are as holy as any other i am holy you are holy the split that flex your lips as you curse out a stranger is disgusting but holy we are disgusting but holy when we leave strangers to die we are leaving the holy when we abandon the lost, we abandon the holy, take your neighbour in hand. Lead them to a crowded A&E, see the doctors pull on their gloves, the gloves are holy, the hospital is holy, the cracked linoleum and buzzing vending machine, holy, holy, holy. To save a life is holy, all life is holy. Lord, even death can be holy when a person is ready to go. But back to sacred space, let's go. What have you got, Charles and Claire? <laughs> um, uh, well, I was, I was just going to pick up on your point about uh, the beautiful, actually, because uh, it just so reminded me of years and years ago when I was in Bristol. And in Bristol Cathedral, which was a very modern, very pure, sort of aesthetically perfect cathedral, there were signs all around the church saying things like, please do not pass beyond this point, and uh, please do not put candles on the statue, and please do not put flowers um, in this space. And, um, and I remember just how alienating that, that felt, um, and what you were saying about really the beauty of 
uh, a space is where people can be themselves and express themselves and uh, and it, it was it was actually quite a, an object lesson for me because I'd recently been to Lourdes and been rather sort of horrified by the kind of tackiness of, of some of it but actually um, I'd also recently visited a, 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 a disabled lady in, in Swansea and she had a little snow globe up there with you know the Virgin Mary in the middle of it and I realized that actually that was a very sacred space that she had made for that for that object. And and I'd had I had to sort of let go of all that kind of aesthetic purity and recognize a different kind of beauty, a beauty which was more deep, deeply human. So I guess I haven't really got a question, but um, I found your talk absolutely fascinating in uh, and how it was really talking about, you know, what 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 is church? What is church fundamentally? And uh, it was very poignant in places, you know, the, that that sense of, of 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 the chaos of it all sometimes, and the the lost histories and the recovered histories. But that's part of what it means to be truly human, I think. So thank you so much, Jay. I really enjoyed it. So I think it's a, it's a really interesting commentary on um, modern church buildings. So Clifton Cathedral, absolutely gorgeous. Some people absolutely hate it, but you know, I love I love a brutalist building. Um, but there is something about because these buildings haven't been lived in yet, you know, um, and the same with um, more modern churches. They haven't been knocked around enough yet for me um, there because as soon as something hasn't been lived in, you try and keep it that way. Right. It's like when you get a brand new sofa and you don't let anyone put their shoes on it. Um, and then sort of four years later, it's too late. It's, it's already been ruined to do what you want. And there is there is a sense of that in in churches um, that the newer ones it's don't do this, don't do that. You might damage it. And it's like, is it damage or is it you're living in it, you're worshiping it, you're using it. You know, I, I go to very you know medieval churches which have what I call architectural murder mysteries. Um, and it's sort of who knocked down what and when. Um, and you can see the scars and the history and, and the damage and the change. And as I've said, how it evolves for the community um, and places that are seen as too shiny to change you're fitting the community in, you're not molding the building around the community, the community has to change for the building. And there is a contention there. And I think, honestly, you know, people hate modern architecture. Uh, but I think part of what they find uncomfortable about these spaces, is the fact that they're not lived in, and they don't feel like they can walk in and be at home. Um, whereas older churches, as shown, are littered with bits of people's stuff, and we knocked a bit down, and the walls are all scratched up. Um, and when people try and keep it shiny, 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 there is, I think, a problem there. Um, I recently went to um, Liverpool, went to Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral, and you know she's grand and shiny and everything, and then there was a big drip, like bucket underneath the lantern from where the the stained glass was dripping, and I was like, ah, yes. People love and use this space. And for me, that was the most beautiful part of it. It was not the gorgeous stained glass or some of the absolutely stunning side chapels um, or the great symbolism of it all. It was that moment of people love and use this space um, and it conforms to their needs rather than the other way around. Who's next? no one else has a burning question i have something that i will ask to um finish on um so the the whole thing behind your talk of noticing what you refer to as the chaos and mm. the story that a building wants you to wants to tell and then the story that you actually read when you're, you're walking around the building um and i wondered if if that sense of noticing the small and insignificant parts of something is something that comes up for you in um, other community practices that that we um, take part in as churches or as just you know Christian communities where does that noticing the small things noticing the chaos come into play in other right, so so as a poet, I spend my whole life noticing the small things. Um, you use the small things to make the big point, and that's what poems are. Um, they're just small things making bigger points. Um, the stuff you haven't noticed, reaffirming stuff you maybe didn't notice before. Um, and we do it in community often in ways that we don't notice. Um, so when we try and create a community space, you, you look around the room, right? You see who's not taking part, who's standing at the edges and you try and work out a way to draw them in. When you meet a person for the first time, you read a lot 
about them from the small things, the things you notice, how they're dressed, what they're carrying, um, the way they hold themselves, the way they interact. And by reading those small things, you can decide how best to include them in your community. If they seem fairly timid, you know not to rush in and be like, hey, join in. Um, and it's those small things that, that tell you that and the big stuff that people want to present is always what they want to present right and what you want to present isn't always the truth um i'm sure we have all decided what our zoom background's going to be right and on the other side of the camera is the stuff you don't want to present to the world in my case massive piles of books and paperwork um and so it's working out the difference between the presentation and the truth and the truth is always in in the small things the truth is always always in the small things you know when jesus did miracles they weren't vast it was always the small things right he didn't walk out and go and get diamonds to heal the blind he used mud it's the little stuff that you don't notice the everyday stuff of life that you you use and take from around yourself and and and, and read into um and so I think one of the greatest things that we can do in our lives is begin to notice the smaller stuff um, and see how that speaks to the larger stuff. So that poem that I did about my priest letting me take the silver out, right? Officially, all she did was ask me to run an errand because she had her hands full. But in reality, what was happening was she was giving me trust. She was inviting me into a community. Um, she was showing me that I was part of something. And she was also involving me in the service um, in a way that as someone who'd felt that they couldn't join, be a Christian for many years um, and avoided believing in God despite loving church buildings for many years because I felt that I was the wrong kind of person. That was very, very profound. And that was almost certainly done through her noticing that I wanted this greater connection. And then she gave me that and I noticed in that small action, the larger things around it in the same way that um, in our church, we have the flags up because it's by the symbols um, that mean bigger things. So we have, you know, gay flags all over the place because we're just very messy. Um, but it's, it's the really small stuff that people comment on. So, you know, anyone can put up a gay flag and say, we include the queer community or put up whatever symbol they want and say, we are part of this community. But the authenticity is in the details, right? So at St. Nick's, we have um, a little fridge magnet that's a little gay flag with a cross on it that's very clearly just been picked up from somewhere. And that doesn't get there. Someone doesn't go, right, I'm going to buy one of those to show that I like the gays. That gets there because somebody felt like part of the community ended up with it and, you know, it was a gift or they found it in a shop or something and plonked it on the fridge and it stayed there. Um, when I um, we have rainbow ribbons tied to random bits of the church, um, nobody goes out and buys rainbow ribbons and ties them to the thing and goes, ha-ha, that'll tell the gays that they're welcome. What happens is that those things are naturally done by a community that is authentic in the same way that at Prince's Street, you had all of those signs saying fellowship meetings and stuff. And some of them were very, very formal and clearly designed. And some of them were written up by a community that authentically wanted to draw people in. And it's in that difference between what they present and what they do. And that's the difference in what we present and what we do. And it's what the truth is always in those small details. The truth is in the little extras. We present what we want to the world and then we follow through on with who we are. Um, and it's the same with communities. They present what they want, right? The shiny Instagram photo, the fancy website, the very carefully thought through text. Every church has it, I'm sure, including you as a community, is that very carefully thought through statement of who and what you are. But it's the little stuff that really tells you. So when churches say, um, please stand. And then if a church says that they're very, very inclusive, they say, you know, please stand if you're able or please stand if you're comfortable. And it's by doing that small detail that you know that they've not just written we're inclusive on the website. It's that little, little details that speak to the authenticity of the larger thing. Um, and that's seen in church buildings with the little signs and it's seen through people's actions in the way we behave. And it's seen through our liturgy in, in what we do and how we address other people. And I think that that's a really, really important thing to notice um, mm. and it is it's the small stuff that's important it's always the small stuff that's important and it's the small stuff where the truth hides thank you jay that's a good place for us to finish this evening um thanks again another silent round of applause jay um it's been a pleasure to have you join us um 
Before we go, I'd just like to quickly remind everyone of the, um, or tell you for the first time, of the following summer series events that we have. Um, so on the 8th of June, same time, 7.30 p.m., we have a panel on community and charism, um, a discussion with various people from different dispersed and residential communities about their community's charism and its journey, um, and there'll be an opportunity for questions and discussion. Um, telling stories and sharing learning and experiences. And then Wednesday, the 13th of July, we have Reverend Augustine M joining us um, for a talk on community inclusion and well-being from a theological perspective. Um, and if you don't know um, about Augustine, look him up. He's um, a wonderful minister who leads a church in, in Manchester and um, has done various I think he won BBC Theology Slam or something, something like that. So um, have a look, read up on him, and I hope to see you there. Um, if you'd like to find out more details and um, sign up to these talks, I have been blocked out of the chat, so I can't send the link, but <laughs> it's lcsb.uk forward slash talks. Um, so you can find it all on there. So that's all for this evening. Thank you everyone for joining us. and. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thank you very much, Anna, and thank you very much, Jay. And uh, we may be posting also this video up onto the website for people mm -hmm. who weren't able to join tonight. And um, I just want to join Anna in her thanks and say, Jay, I think I wrote this down right. A community thrives when it gives itself space. When it's given a space, but it when can it's give given itself space. space too. Okay, when it's given, <laughs> I, I'm glad you, so thank Either you. Either works. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> one's for a building, us, one Zoom. Yeah. Thank you for giving us this space tonight to, to hear your thoughts, reflections, to enter into the world of the sacred and the world of St. Nick's and, and all the other beautiful images and poetry you share with us. Thank you so much. <laughs>